Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. When you think of bridges and New York, the Brooklyn Bridge is most likely the first thing to come to mind. It is a marveling and engineering feat of bridge manufacturing, and many know the story of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, but did you know that the bridge was almost scrapped? And if it wasn't for the wife of its chief engineer, the bridge might not exist. That woman is Emily Warren Roebling. Let's get started. <music> Emily Warren was born on September 23rd, 1843 in Cold Spring, New York to Sylvanus and Phoebe Warren. She was the second youngest of 12 children. Her family was upper middle class with Sylvanus being a politician in the New York State Assembly. And with this job, it allowed Emily and her siblings to have a very comfortable childhood. Her fourth oldest brother, Kemba Warren, would go on to become Major General Governor K. Warren and would be a future Union General in the Civil War just to kind of give you a timestamp of where the heck we are in history. <laughs> he and Emily would form a close bond and he supported Emily's pursuit in education. He would even fund her tuition to Georgetown Visitation Academy in Washington, DC, present day Georgetown Visitation Preparatory School, which is a private Catholic college preparatory school. It is the oldest Catholic school for girls in DC and the country, having been founded in 1799 in the original 13 colonies 225 years ago. Here she studied French, algebra, astronomy, housework, needlework, and history. After her brother Kemble led a successful defense of Little Round Top at Gettysburg, yes he was that into the Civil War, he invited Emily to his camp. Don't know why, but it, he just went, hey sis, come on down. In 1864, she visited her brother at his camp with the 5th Army Corps. At the soldier's ball she went to during her visit, she met Washington Roebling and they fell for one another immediately. During the time they met, Washington was in the Union Army and was an officer at the Battle of Gettysburg and was a recent graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute as a civil engineer. The couple would marry on January 18th, 1865 in Cold Spring in a double wedding with one of Emily's siblings. When the Civil War ended in May of 1865, the newlyweds set off for their honeymoon in Europe. While there, a newly pregnant Emily went with her husband to study caissons, which are water type chambers that are opened on the top to keep water out for workers to dig in rivers or oceans to construct bridges or dams. The reason they were researching this is that Washington was working with his father, John A. Roebling, on a new project back in New York. The project was a suspension bridge over the East River that would connect Brooklyn to Manhattan. This bridge was called the Great East River Bridge, later called the Brooklyn Bridge. While they were in Germany, Emily gave birth to their first and only son on November 21st, 1867. He was named after his grandfather, John Augustus Roebling II. Before we continue, let's talk about the Brooklyn Bridge, because not only is it a huge part of Emily's story, but it's also just a really cool bridge, and its story is fascinating, at least to me. The Brooklyn Bridge is a hybrid of a cable stayed and suspension bridge, meaning it's solid as a rock, but still fluctuates. A proposal for a bridge over the East River to connect the two sides of New York were suggested as early as 1800, because at that time, the best way to cross the river was a ferry and those aren't exactly known for being very fast. There were many approaches to the bridge's construction, from a chain bridge, to a link bridge, to even a tunnel that would go underneath the river, but that was scrapped because that was gonna be hella expensive. It wasn't until a German immigrant engineer, John, proposed a suspension bridge in 1857 that the bridge started to take form. Now, John already had a good track record of building solid bridges, like the Roebling Delaware Aqueduct Bridge in Pennsylvania, which is the oldest suspension bridge in the country, if you didn't know that, and the Niagara Suspension Bridge. This bridge was the first working railway suspension bridge in history. So I think he knows what he's doing. <laughs> just a little bit, just 
just just a little bit. John was named chief engineer and by September of 1867 presented his plan. This bridge would be longer and taller than any suspension bridge ever built. It would have roads and railway tracks with tolls and fares that would provide funding for the construction. It would also be a pedestrian pathway. Now, the people were jazzed as hell about this bridge, saying it would have as much of an impact as the first transatlantic telegraph cable, transcontinental railroad, and the Suez Canal. And if you don't know what the Suez Canal is, the Suez Canal was where that really big shipping container boat got stuck sideways and had to do a 68 point turn, you know, that Suez Canal. A boat got stuck in a canal and it was actually really fun to watch. In November of 1867, the New York State Senate passed a bill allowing the construction of the bridge and two months later, the New York and Brooklyn Bridge Company was integrated into the board of directors. Of course, there were concerns and criticisms about the design and John heard and took it all in. And to set at ease any concerns, John threw a and I kid you not, a bridge party in March of 1869 and invited engineers and members of the US Congress to see the blueprints and answer any questions. I wanna go to a bridge party. <laughs> I mean, how much fun would that be? We're gonna go to a bridge party to talk about a bridge. Is it black tie or casual wear? <laughs> During its construction and finish, the love and lore of the bridge was so much that, according to legend, the bridge would become the most photographed structure in the world. But little do people know, the construction of the bridge was way more treacherous from the start. Literally. When Emily and Washington returned from Europe in 1868, Washington became assistant engineer on the project alongside his father. However, on June 28, 1869 at Fulton Ferry, which was a ferry dock along the river where the Brooklyn Bridge would later be built, John was just standing there chilling, working on solidifying the location of where the bridge would be when his foot was crushed on some wooden pilings by an arriving ferry. Now, I don't know how that happens, but uh, I, my only guess is, is that he was so far into the dock, maybe he didn't think about don't put your foot where the ferry's gonna come into? I don't know. The injuries were so bad that the injured toes on his foot had to be amputated. Now, the injury probably could have been fixed if he didn't pull the tough man card and refused further medical treatment after the amputation and wanted to cure it by alternative medicine of water therapy or hydrotherapy. Now, I'm not knocking this. This is a thing and it actually has scientific proof that it does help a lot of injuries. What I'm saying is in the 1860s, and I assume in his mind, and please correct me if I'm wrong, water therapy to him meant just continuously pouring water over the wound with like no herbs, no nothing, I don't know. Oh, and just to let you know in what kind of history point we are, remember, we're in 1869, right? And you would think, well, why doesn't he just do penicillin to cure out the wound? At least do that instead of just pouring water over the freaking thing. But get this, the Brooklyn Bridge was built and finished before penicillin was discovered. The Brooklyn Bridge, 1870s-ish, Penicillin, 1925. Just to give you a perspective of where we are in history. No surprise to us. His condition deteriorated. He contracted tinnitus or lockjaw, which is a bacterial infection that causes muscle spasms. It's a horrible way to die. And by June 22nd, 1969, died of that. Barely made it a month. 24 days, in fact, after the accident. Horrible death. After his death, his son Washington became chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge Project at the age of 32. Luckily, Washington was his father's right-hand man and knew it just as well as his father and was confident in his ability to continue and finish the project. 
On January 2nd, 1870, construction of the 6,000 foot long Brooklyn Bridge officially began. Workers began using shovels and dynamite to scrape away the bedrock to begin to construct the two 278 foot tall towers. These are built with Roselandale cement, limestone, and granite and has the classic Gothic look many New York buildings had at that time. Now, Washington was the main designer of the two huge air type cases that would become the foundation of the two towers. One thing to know about Washington is that he was not one to make commands and decisions from his desk. He spent as much time with his men on the construction site as possible. Coming from his army days, he also worked right alongside his men. And with that, he would put himself in as much danger as his men were working with caissons. But unfortunately, the knowledge of the dangers of working under air compression was not understood, and this would needless to say, not end well. In the spring of 1872, a fire broke out in one of the caissons from within the caisson. Now, remember, these things are underneath the water and the efforts to extinguish the fire caused Washington to get compression sickness or the bends. This happens when someone comes up from a great depth underwater too quickly and causes nitrogen to form bubbles in the bloodstream. The effects range from joint pain to paralysis to even death. Since Washington got the bends, or at this time known as casein disease, this shattered his health. By the end of 1972, it damaged his sight, hearing, and left him partially paralyzed and bedridden. So obviously, he can't exactly go to the construction site anymore. Enter his wife, Emily. With her husband being the now chief engineer, Emily was pretty hands-on with her husband's work. After his accident, although he was basically blind and deaf, his mind was still sharp and continued to direct the construction from their home in Brooklyn. Emily became both her husband's nurse and private secretary. She took over all writings of her husband's letters and kept his books. She reviewed construction plans, visited the site, met with contractors, and even went to board meetings. She literally became her husband's eyes, ears, legs, and arm. That wasn't paralyzed which I don't know if it was his left or his, or his right. I hope it wasn't his dominant hand because that would really suck. She would give him information about the progress of the bridge and from this, Emily got extensive knowledge of the bridge's cable construction, strength of materials, stress analysis, and calculating the catenary of the cable's curves. Catenary is the U-shaped curves in bridges, power lines, park fencing, things like that. Emily took over many of her husband's chief engineer duties, including project management, management. She did face-to-face -face interviews, negotiated contracts, kept the records, and represented her husband at social functions. She got so dang good at this job and compelled so much information that people believed that she was behind the bridge's design. Washington knew the amount of work his wife was doing and never failed to give her credit to the construction of the bridge. Quote, I thought I was to come, but I had a strong tower to lean upon, my wife, a woman of infinite tact and wisest counsel, end quote. And can I just say, I think that's really cute because they're building the towers of the bridge and he has his wife as a tower to lean on. I just think that that's a cute little mesh up of what the, I, I just think it's cute. Unlike today, the Brooklyn Bridge was built by hand. And due to that, there were a ton of injuries, falls, and deaths. Many because unlike today, there were no safety nets and a lot of injuries went undocumented. Plus, you know, I mean, just look at some of these pictures. This is sketchy as heck. And they're building a bridge and they're walking on a little wooden platform. No, mm -mm. that is sketchy. Plus the cost of it was going up and up and up. By 1875, the towers alone weren't completed and the project had depleted its original budget, and this baffles me, of $5 million or $118.4 million today, and the towers aren't finished. Luckily, they were able to get another $8 million or $189.5 million, but needless to say, it was way over budget. 
And due to this, by 1882, Washington's title of chief engineer was in jeopardy, mainly because he was never seen at the site and people didn't know why. See, Emily and Washington worked very carefully to make sure Washington's illness and the reason for her sudden constant appearance was kept a secret. This was in part because Seth Lowe, the then mayor of Brooklyn, was wanting to replace Washington with a friend in 1881. And this was because the project kept facing delays and, like I said, the crazy amount of cost increases. So it was natural that skepticism about Washington's ability to complete the bridge came under scrutiny. But Emily's constant involvement and presence in everything Brooklyn Bridge could not be ignored. She even delivered a statement made by her husband to the American Society of Civil Engineers, which was already brave because women didn't or really kind of weren't allowed to speak in public. And the fact that she did that to a room of male engineers, for hella brave on her part. Fortunately, and to her relief, her speech was respected and responded to well, and Washington kept his job. By the end of the project, the chief wire engineer for the Brooklyn Bridge, E.F. Farrington, referred to Emily as, quote, the first female field engineer, and even announced her as such to the Cooper Union. During the construction, though Washington wasn't there, he was able to watch the bridge get higher and higher from his bed with a telescope and binoculars. By the time the bridge was completed in 1883, the cost was about 15 million or about 460.88 million dollars. Wow. <laughs> wow. Due to Emily's massive contribution to the Brooklyn Bridge, she was the first to cross the bridge by a car that she drove herself on its opening day on May 24th, 1883, 14 years after construction began. On that day, 150,000 people crossed the 6,016 foot bridge under a sea of fireworks. I mean, look how cool this picture is of the, its opening day. That is epic. At the time of its completion, the Brooklyn Bridge was the longest bridge in the world. Emily's role in the bridge's construction did not go unknown. At the opening ceremony, New York City Congressman Abram Hewitt thanked her extensively in his speech. Quote, the name of Emily Warren Roebling will be inseparably associated with all that is admirable in human nature and all that is wonderful in the constructive world of art. This bridge is an everlasting monument to the self-sacrificing devotion of a woman and of her capacity for that higher education from which she has been too long disbarred." End quote. And little did he know, he basically predicted the future. When the bridge was completed, her and Washington moved to Trenton, New Jersey, and she managed the construction of their mansion. I mean, shoot, she built a freaking bridge. A mansion is nothing. Come on. She used the next decade to focus on herself and her family. John, her son, had begun to suffer from a heart condition, and Emily began to monitor it closely. She moved with him to Troy, New York, to help him monitor his heart condition, while he went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which, if you remember, his dad went to. John graduated from the school in 1889, and when he married in that same year, him and his new wife moved to Oracle, Arizona. After that, Emily began to have an active social life and took on important roles in many organizations, including the Huguenot Society, the Committee of Cirrhosis, which was the first professional women's club in the U.S., Evelyn College for Women, the Daughters of the American Revolution, which she was nominated to become the president of the organization in 1901, and many more. She also participated in social organizations. She also participated in social organizations such as the Relief Society during the Spanish-American War in 1898. Just again to give you a little piece of where we are in history. Being both a nurse and construction foreman for a house for soldiers returning from the war. Because again, she built the Brooklyn Bridge. What is a mansion and a house for some returning soldiers gonna challenge her about? She also traveled and attended a ton of crazy things. For example, 
She was at the coronation of Nicholas II, and this baffles me, which happened on May 26, 1896. I was born on May 26, 1998 freaking nuts in St. Petersburg. She also was low-key presented to Queen Victoria in 1896. And of course, you know who freaking Queen Victoria is, Queen of England at that point in time. But yeah, she was presented to her, you know, whatever, it's fine. I don't know what was said. I don't know how she was presented. All I hope was that she was presented to Queen Victoria as the builder of the Brooklyn Bridge, because that is a flex unlike anything else. <laughs> During all this traveling, Washington is still unfortunately ill. And before we move on from that, I don't know what happened to him. I, I don't know if he ever recovered from it. I was doing so much research on her that I didn't have time to look up what happened to him. You know what? Let's look up what happened to him. What happened to Washington here? What happened to good old Washington here? So at some point he recovered from his injury and from 1902 to 1903 he served as president of the alumni association at Rensselaer and remarried in 1908. Oh shoot and then went down with the Titanic in 1912. Oh dang and then he died in 1926 at the age of 89. Now we know. <laughs> Quick little sidebar there. Anyway, when she got back to the States, she traveled across the country giving lectures about her time in Russia for the Federation of Women's Club. Proving you're never too old to go to college, she went to New York University in 1899 where she passed the women's law course at the university and got a law certificate for women in business or other fields where law knowledge would be useful. Meaning that essentially she became one of the first female lawyers in New York State. Cause of course she freaking did. Oh, and plus she studied math and science and officially learned how to build a bridge. Because I guess since she built the Brooklyn Bridge, she kind of was just, did the Cliff Notes version of it. But this time she actually officially learned how to build a bridge. But yeah, she did all that at the age of 56. You're never too old, baby. And might I say her graduating picture's badass. <laughs> Love all that. She also entered the program's essay contest and won with an essay titled A Wife's Disabilities. And it was read out loud at the graduation ceremony. Her health began to decline in 1901, but for the next two years, she continued to express the themes from her essay to people all over the country and continued to advocate for women's equality at the dawn of the women's suffrage movement. Emily Roran Roebling died on February 28th, 1903 from stomach cancer at only 59 years old. In her essay that was read aloud at the graduation, it began with Emily arguing that women wished, quote, to avail themselves of the possible rights given them under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution in order to have a voice in deciding questions of interest to them in laws made by the legislatures of different states, end quote. She also criticized how married women lacked property rights. She noted that male lawmakers were, quote, unwilling to make laws which add to the independence of wives or their freedom of action of widows, end quote. And I know for a fact it would have put a huge smile on her face that not too long after her death, the first women's suffrage demonstration began with a group of women engineers parading down Fifth Avenue in 1913. By the late 1940s, the bridge had been modernized to accommodate new cars. The train tracks were taken away. However, the original pedestrian walkways still exist and is a very popular destination for tourists. On the tragic day of September 11, 2001, the walkways were used for fleeing pedestrians to get to Lower Manhattan during the burning and collapse of the World Trade Centers. And possibly one of the most famous pictures of the Brooklyn Bridge alongside the World Trade Centers was taken on that tragic day when the second plane flew into the South Tower. Her role in the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge and her status as a woman in the U.S. during the late 19th century is highlighted in the second season of HBO's period drama The Gilded Age, where she is played by Liz Wasson. 
Known as the silent builder of the Brooklyn Bridge, Emily's legacy as an unofficial engineer and her sacrifice to help her husband's great feat is memorialized in the bridge itself. In 1951, the Emily Warren Roebling Memorial Plaque was erected by the Brooklyn Bridge Engineers Club that honors all three of the engineers of the bridge, but mainly Emily. At the end of the inscription, it says, quote, Back of every great work, we can find the self-sacrificing devotion of a woman boom bam thank you man there you go now you know the story you might have already known but maybe not as in depth as i did about the woman who basically built the brooklyn bridge she helped negotiate contracts she oversaw interviews she oversaw the progress of the bridge and related back to her husband who couldn't be there because he's kind of sort of paralyzed she basically built the brooklyn bridge alongside her husband and i love that the plaque has washington's father washington and Emily's name on it but what I love the most is that Emily is at the very very top of that list I just love it so much <laughs> that wraps up our women's history month I have a potential new job offer coming in um but I will keep you guys updated of course in the community post so keep a lookout for that please subscribe to this channel and while you're down there I hope you learned something today and like and share this video and leave a friendly comment I will be back next week with another video and until then don't be well behaved, you just might make history. See you next time, guys.